Next session, the fourth session will be about literature and thought. Namely, we had one talk on literature, one talk on thought, so we put them together in one uh, session. <laughs> Very happy that uh, Dr. Miriam Goldstein will be talking. She is a graduate of Harvard, <coughs> Cambridge, and the Hebrew University. Uh, is that like for for God, country God in Yale? Is that right? Goes, <laughs> goes up from the scale. Uh, her book has just appeared. It's in the display over there on uh, Abu Faraj Harun's, uh, I'd say, um, uh, summary or, or uh, adaptation. Adaptation, right? Because he didn't he didn't summarize. He didn't he didn't. Uh, make it smaller. His adaptation of Yusuf Ibn Nuf's commentary on the Torah. It's uh, available at Amazon and other fine bookstores. <laughs> right. Oh, this isn't grill. It's only, what is it, three poles? More Zeebach. More, more it's not so bad. Right. <laughs> Wait till the video. Or, or, the, or, the, or the movie edition. Um, Miriam now teaches at Hebrew University. And we'll be talking about the literature of its time and place, new directions, and examination of Judeo Arabic Karaite works. Thank you. Thanks, Denny. And thanks very much for the uh, invitation to speak and hosting the conference. It's really nice to be here. Um, so, what I want to do today is first of all explain what I mean by my title. Um, and then I want to give a specific example of what I'm talking about. Um, so, when I say a literature of its time and place, um, I mean let me sit down, uh, an examination of the literary aspects of Judeo-Arabic works written by Karaites and others as representative of their period, their time, and their location, uh, the Near East. Um, First of all, why, why new directions? Because this type of literary analysis really hasn't been done enough yet. Now, let me explain via um, a look at what's been done. Um, first of all, when I say it's time in place, this uh, induces us to consider comparison. And a comparative approach in the field of Judeo-Arabic studies is natural and is already in use. Uh, by its nature, researchers who are working on works in Judeo-Arabic can't afford to look at what they're doing in a vacuum. Um, by the way, this contrast to Arabists who work with Arabic literature and often limit their view to Arabic literature as written by Muslims and ignore Arabic literature as written by Jews and Christians. Uh, and you sometimes have to call them on it, which I did um, in, a, in a book review not so long ago of uh, um, a, a very learned book by a person named Shaukat Turaw. Um, so a comparative approach in Judeo-Arabic studies is natural. Um, no scholar of Judeo-Arabic literature can ignore the models uh, from the uh, Arabic environment when he's examining, he or she is examining the content. Um, and in general, this is part of the discussion provided as background to discussion of works rather than standing independently. And this is true of the research of most of the people in this room. Um, each of us in our own fields, as well as our predecessors in the field of Judeo-Arabic studies. So a comparative approach in terms of contents is very basic to our field. Um, that was about its time and place. Now, talking about literature. Uh, if we leave content per se alone and talk about um, literary considerations, I note that there has been analysis of genres of Judeo-Arabic literature, that is, division of works in Judeo-Arabic and Karaite works as part of them according to literary genres as well as according to function. Uh, this began with Steinschneider, uh, Die Arabische Literatur der Juden, and then it continued with uh, Rina Drory, who's already been mentioned today, and Rashid Hamagaim. Um, now there have been uh, a number of articles by Meira Poliak uh, on, this, on this question of genres. Um, as well as a recent article together with Yoram Erder in which they talk, they mention genres. And there's been an entire book edited on canon um, recently that has relevant articles to genres in Judeo-Arabic um, by Sarah Strumza, Tzvi Stamper, Miriam Frankel, and Zev Elkin. Um, analysis of genres in Judeo-Arabic literature is, was and is very necessary. 
and it added to the micro-analysis, it's sort of a macro-analysis that added to the micro-analysis that was already well represented in the field in terms of linguistic analysis, which is certainly a very well-developed field in Judeo-Arabic literature. Okay, so on the one hand, we have analysis of genres. On the other hand, a micro-analysis of linguistic aspects. And what I'm calling for is something in the middle, something in between what we could call the macroscopic, looking at genres and specific contents and how they suit the Arabic Islamic environment, certainly quite important, and the equally important microscopic examination of morphology and syntax. I'm calling for a look at the units of composition and the style in which works are written. Now, this has already begun. I want to describe two important types of contribution to this area that have already made important initial steps in the direction that I'm describing. Uh, number one is the framework. The framework has been set in that in Jewish studies, there has already been much analysis of the transition from oral uh, trends in communication to a combination of oral and written communication. And I'm talking about articles by Jakub Zussmann, uh, Neil Danzig, uh, Robert Brody and Rena Drury, uh, among others. Um, so this discussion of the transition from oral to oral and written uh, has been very well done so far in Jewish studies. I note, by the way, that in studies of Arabic literature, it's very clear that uh, not as much has been done. Uh, scholars of Arabic literature as a whole haven't given as much thought to this transition as scholars of Judeo-Arabic literature have. Um, they certainly haven't had the kinds of backs and forths that are obvious in uh, research in Jewish studies on this issue. That's number one, okay, that, that kind of a framework. Number two is that the specific kind of literary analysis that I'm calling for has begun. And I want to detail uh, the important contributions that have been made in this area. Um, two works on the development of monographs, on the fact that Jews adopted the monograph form in writing uh, by Robert Brody and by David Sclair. Um, Rina Drury, who has discussed many aspects of style that were adopted um, by, by writers writing in Judeo-Arabic, um, very much a pioneer in this area in her book. Um, Meira Polyak's articles on genres also relate in, in certain instances to this question. Um, uh, Eliezer Schlossberg on Sadia as an adib who composed in the genre of adab and Zev Elkin's recent continuation of this perspective on Saadia. Uh, Sarah Strunza, who looked at introductions in Judeo-Arabic, in Saadia specifically, and Stephen Harvey on other introductions. Um, and Davis Clare, who wrote on the question and answer style, um, and, and also touched on issues of um, um, related to uh, examinations of the units of composition or the style of works. These are a blessed and welcome beginning. But there's much more to do in this area in an examination of Judeo-Arabic literature as literature, a literature of its time and place. Um, and I want to cite four um, desiderata that I think are important um, when, we, when we think about this field. One is that we need to continue the examination of the literary structure and style of works of different genres composed in Judeo-Arabic. Number two is from there, we must evaluate how classical structures of Arabic literature are put to use by authors composing in Judeo-Arabic. Third, we need to consider what is particular to Jewish authors. For example, beyond the introductory basmala and the use of biblical verses rather than Quranic verses, do Jewish authors write in a particular way or use literary elements in a particular way? Um, number four, Rabbinites versus Karaites. Um, do they use literary models from the Arabic environment in the same way? And this might require a re-examination of um, what Rina Jory has to say uh, on these uh, issues. Um, for me, what I'm about to present today and, and my consideration of these questions is part of a larger product, uh, a larger project of examining paratexts in general in Arabic literature and Judeo-Arabic literature. Um, it's a project that's funded by the ISF that, I've, um, that I'll be doing together with a colleague working in Persian literature, uh, Yulia Rubanovich. And the idea is that we're going to check the formative centuries of Arabic and of Judeo-Arabic writing, um, as well as Persian and Judeo-Persian, um, to look at how elements of, of structure developed. Um, 
So today I want to give an example um, based on a composition by Abu Farah Terun, um, his glossary. Um, and I call it his glossary in English for now. Soon you'll see that it has many different names in Arabic. Um, it's a glossary of the entire Bible, which he composed late in life after concluding the uh, Al Kitab al Kafi. Uh, it's a work that's very well attested in the collections of the Russian National Library. Uh, and I came across it in my work um, cataloging under the stewardship of Dr. David Sclair and the uh, Center for the Study of Judeo-Arabic Literature and Culture of the Bensvi Institute. Um, I identified about 60 fragments from about 40 distinct manuscripts. Um, and this is somewhat less, for example, than the numbers attested in Al-Kitab al-Kafi, but it was clearly a very popular composition. <coughs> um, so I'll show you one picture of it. Um, because there were so many different fragments, the, the fragments spanned the 11th to the 15th centuries. It was, you could see a, a development in the manuscript tradition. So in earlier manuscripts like this one, the composition is normally written in lines straight across. Um, and what we're talking about is, uh, you can see that you have the book's title, which is somewhat um, prominent here, uh, prominent, made prominent by spaces. Um, then you have the quote that's uh, the difficult word or the difficult phrase that's being translated from the Bible. Then you have the translation into Arabic. And then you have mithla, okay, uh, like, uh, and then another example of the use of that root uh, somewhere, from somewhere else in the Bible. So that's the way the book is written. So it's only difficult words. It's not a glossary of everything. And when I show you the paratext that we want to talk about, um, which is actually the conclusion to the work, you'll we'll, we'll get familiar with um, some of Abu Faraj Harun's considerations. Um, so this is a somewhat early manuscript. Uh, in later manuscripts, uh, oftentimes the, the titles of the books are made more prominent. Um, and in even later manuscripts, such as this one, um, the, the various, um, the words and the translation and the proof text are often written in columns. So you can see that here. And you can also see it in this manuscript. Um, so I haven't done a, a systematic examination of this, but um, as far as I can tell, this is sort of a progression that you see in the organization of the manuscript, or in the organi organization of the way the, the work is written down. Now, in terms of the title, what was the name of this work? Um, it appears in the text in, with many different titles. So, for example, um, one is this, Al-Juz al-Thani min Tafsir al-Fad al-Mikra. Okay, Tafsir al-Fad al-Mikra, the translation of the words of the Bible or something like that. Um, or maybe this one. Another example, Baruch noten la ya'ev koach u le'en unim utsma ya'obay. Kamula Tafsir al-Fad al-Mikra. Tafsir al-Fad al-Mikra. Or perhaps this one, which is sort of difficult to exactly figure out how to translate it. Um, so the explanation of words which have some sort of difficulty of etymology or yeah, something like that, difficulty of etymology. Um, but it's clear that uh, the title of the work varied um, in, in, in different copies. Kamulat al Fadel Mikra al Arba ve Esrim Sfarim as Saaba. Okay, so uh, the difficult words of, of the 24 books of the Bible, something like that. Um, so, in contrast to Abu Faraj Harun's other works, which definitely had fixed titles that you can see referred to consistently everywhere, this work doesn't seem to have had a fixed title. And it's also difficult to figure out what Abu Faraj Harun himself called it because he doesn't, as far as I know, he doesn't call it by name uh, from within the work. Uh, and since it was his last work, he doesn't refer to it in any of his other works. So it's unclear exactly what to call this work. Uh, so what I want to talk about today uh, is the conclusion of the work. Abu Faraj Harun concluded the work uh, with what's called a postface. So a postface is a preface that comes at the end of a work. Um, you see here, Kamula, 
right here. Um, and in it, he includes many of the tropes of the classic authorial preface in Arabic. Um, so what I've done um, is an analysis of the authorial tropes that he uses in this preface um, in accordance with um, what was common in his surroundings. Uh, the authorial preface was a required trapping of composition in Arabic uh, by the 10th century uh, at, the, at the latest, I mean, maybe even earlier. Um, it was a true product of its region, constructed on Syriac and Greek paradigms, um, which were associated with a commentarial tradition. If you were writing a commentary on an author in Syriac or in Greek, you would write an introduction to introduce the work, to introduce the author, to introduce various considerations about the work you were commenting on. Um, over time, writers adapted this preface form in order to use it for their own works, to describe their own works. They were the author under discussion, so they would use it to introduce what they were about to do. This development um, from commenting on someone else's work to using it to describe your own work occurred already in Syriac um, and was transferred also into Arabic, where the use of such prefaces is attested from the 9th century. Um, <coughs> So I want to show you uh, how Abu Faraj Harun himself puts this sort of form to use. Um, in terms of what survived of other prefaces of Abu Faraj Harun, I, had to, I looked into this a bit in order to compare. Um, the preface to Al-Kitab al-Kafi has survived and was published by Jeffrey Khan, and I'll refer to it a bit here. The preface uh, to Al-Kitab al, al mushtamil uh, Professor Maman tells me, has not survived, and um, Professor Khan tells me that uh, the preface to Hidayat al-Qari in the long version has not survived either. So we're not very good. Um, but the short, we have three introductions because the preface to, to the short Hidayat al Qari, uh, Guide to the Reader, has survived. Um, this postface has survived in two manuscripts this one and, and this one. Um, so it begins, uh, as is customary, with a discussion of the circumstances of the composition of the glossary. So this is how it begins with this kamula, ken, uh, hushlam. I mean, it, it was finished. Um, missing, of course, are the usual elements of the basmala and the hamdala, the um, in the name of God and the praise of God that are normally found at the beginning of prefaces. But this is probably due to the fact that Abu Farid Harun concludes the composition with a thanks to God for helping him conclude it. So maybe he felt that he didn't need to go into all of that again. Um, Okay, so I thought what I would do, I'm, I'm actually um, interested in getting comments on my, Arab, my translation also. So that was why I brought the Arabic, but I have a translation after it. Um, Danny, what do you think is better? I can, maybe we'll, all right, I'll read through the Arabic and then I'll put up the translation. Okay, so anyway. Kamula ma'al tamassahu al-shaykh al-fadil Abu Tayyib Shmuel ibn Mansur harasahu Allahu li waladayhi ahyahum Allahu min tafsir al-alfad al-sa'ba fil mikra. مع ما يكون من الألفاظ قد قدر ما من الصعوبة أيضا بحيث لم يبلغ في الاشتهار والاتساع ومعرفة المقصد به مبلغ غيره مما لا يكاد يخفى هو أو الكثير منه عمن قرأ القرآن ولم يفسره. Okay, so uh, I'll stop there. We have completed the work requested by the eminent elder Abu Tayyib Samuel ibn Mansur. May God preserve him. For his two sons, may God give them life. So we have here a specific request um, to compose, while oftentimes, as uh, Jeffrey Kahn mentioned earlier, oftentimes the request to compose is simply that a, a fictional theme. In the case of the glossary, it's clearly no fiction. Um, he, Abu Faraj Harun composed the glossary following an actual request. He cites the name of the issuer, Abu Tayyib Samuel ibn Mansur, um, this type of specificity is not to be found in the vaguer fictional type of request. Um, I haven't figured out who this person is, uh, despite a lot of looking. Um, if anyone has help, I'll be happy. Um, <clears throat> what was he requested to do? The, exp the explanation of difficult words in the Bible, in addition to words with some lesser degree of difficulty, in that their meanings are less commonly used and known than others, which are surely known by those who read the Bible even without a translation. Man qara'a al-Qur'an wa lam yufasirhu. Such as heaven and earth, ate and drank, and others. 
This, in addition to the repetition of certain explanations following their initial explanation, which he, may God preserve him, requested. So there is some type of repetition in his work, he points out. Now, the next thing that Abu Faraj Harun is going to do in this postface is to detail the contents of his work to the reader, who surely knows what's in the work since he's already read it. So this is sort of interesting in that this section comes at the end of the work. Um, and what he is going to include is a justification of some of the contents of his work. So, so he starts, in كَانَ هَذَا الْقَدْرِ هُوَ الَّذِي طَلَّبَهُ مِنِّي فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ جَاءَ فِي خَلَلِهِ وَتَضَعُفِهِ مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ شَيْءٍ مِنْ عِدَّةْ مَوَادِعْ لَهَا تَعَلُّقْ بِالْمَعْنَى وَاللُّغَةْ قَصَّتُ إِرَادَهَا فِيهِ لِأَنِّي إِسْتَغْرَبْتُهَا عَنْدَمَا لَاحَتْ لِي وَظَنَّنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَتَضَمَنْهَا كِتَابًا مِنْ كُتُبْ مَنْ تَقَدَّمَا مِنْ مُسَنَّفِي كُتُبِ التَّفَسِيرِ وَاللُّغَةِ Okay, so what is he saying? He says, and even though وَلَا إِنْ كَانَ It's sort of an interesting thing in Judeo-Arabic. Not وَا إِنْ كَانَ, but وَلَا إِنْ كَانَ. And even though this was the extent that he requested of me, I have included in his spaces and interstices something different, a variety of issues relevant to exegesis and to grammar, which I decided to include because they were completely unknown to me on first appraisal. Istagrabtuha. And because I deemed that they were not included in any of the books of the earlier compilers of exegetical or grammatical works. Okay, let's go back a second. فَرَأَيْتُ لِذَلَكَ تَقْدِيم تَعْلِيقِهَا فِي هَذَا الْكِتَابِ وَأَنْ لَا أُؤَخِرُهَا مَعَ الْعَزِمْ على تعليقها مما سواه مما هو بها أليق خوفا من من الاقتطاع عن ذلك وعما سواه بالموت أو غيره أو غيره من قوات الزمان. Okay, so what's the issue here? He says, I therefore considered it appropriate to hasten and to explain them in this composition rather than delaying them till later, despite my original intention to include them in some other work more suitable to them due to my fear of being interrupted from this intent and others, due to death or one of the other interruptions of fate. Okay, so there are, there are very many fascinating things in what Abu Faraj Hamoun says. Um, so he, he points out that he's included all sorts of uh, inappropriate things. I mean, this is not just going to be a book of definitions. It's going to have grammatical issues in it as well. Why? So he points out two reasons. One is that he noticed that certain important discussions hadn't been mentioned in other works. Um, a second consideration is personal. He says that he's worried that he won't have time or place, or time, I guess, to write it down later. Um, and clearly this was a, a good call on his part. Um, now, in explaining his decision to include these sorts of um, uncalled for contents in the glossary, because after all, his requester just asked for a glossary, not for a work of grammar. He mentions the books of the earlier compilers of exegetical or grammatical works. Um, authors in their prefaces, and in this case in their postfaces, often refer to what's been composed in the past. They refer to the works of their predecessors. Normally, um, the author chooses one of two approaches. He either minimizes the value of earlier authors' works and aggrandizes the value of his own, or in an alternate approach, such as, for example, that taken by Yefet ben Eli, he can emphasize the compilatory nature of his own work, denying any originality, and saying basically that he's part of a chain of transmission. What Abu Faraj Harun does here is not part of the standard repertoire of authorial introductory elements. First of all, he establishes his work in a broader genre than you might have otherwise thought. He doesn't compare his glossary to earlier glossaries. He talks about it in the genre of grammatical works in general. Okay, so first of all, that's interesting. Second of all, he's not boasting here. It's not the authorly boast of originality and superseding earlier authors. He appears to be striving for scientific truth and to be, to be speaking very sincerely here. Um, and by the way, uh, Aharon Maman told me, I was lucky enough to hear from him that Apparently, this was a, a continuous trope on Abu Faraj Hirun's part, that he wasn't going to have time to write something down. And this is the secret of the fact that the first seven books of Kitab al-Mushtama were concluded, and then Abu Faraj Hirun was lucky enough to be able to write the eighth part. So 
So this seems to have been actually a trope on his part that he wasn't going to have time to write things down. Um, in the continuation of his postface, he provides a detailed explanation of the types of side discussions that he's going to include. Now, I'll spare you the details here, okay? وَجَاءَ فِيهِ أَيْضًا مَا لَيْسَ لَهُ تَعَلَّقْ بِتَفْسِيرْ لَفْضَ فِيهَا سُعُوبًا وَهُوَ عَلَى الدُّرُوبِ Okay, so there are all sorts of explanations that are not related to tafsir al fath that are not related to translations. Wahua al adrub, and there are various different kinds, and he details all the kinds in an incredibly technical discussion that I think nobody is expecting when they look at the preface or a postface of an author. Now, this type of technical discussion, like for example, I brought one here about synonyms. Um, uh, I'll just show you the part of the translation. Abu Faraj Harun did this a lot. Um, anyone who's looked at the introduction to Al-Kitab al-Kafi knows that it's not simply an introduction, that Abu Faraj Harun begins his book with a very complex technical discussion of why it's important to learn grammar. And he brings a very technical example in which you have to have some background to understand. So here he does the same thing. He brings all sorts of technical examples uh, basically to show you what's in his book. And by the way, he does the same thing in the introduction to the short Hidayat al-Qari. He's, he's not scared to sort of scare his reader off by bringing um, difficult material. Um, the final example he brings is this uh, concept called tasqim, which is leveling. Um, basically where you change a, word, change a letter or change a word in order to make the meaning um, adhere to what you think it should be. Um, but the important thing that I wanted to show you is Starts right here. Um, he says, "Walam, right, starting there. Walam aati ala kul kul mauda yahtaj ila mithli dalika fil mikra bal ala al baad minhu khawfan min al itala wal wa itisa al kitab bi dalika wa khurujhi an al had aladi tamasahu harasahu Allahu." So he says, in terms of this type of discussion about leveling, in this case. I haven't given all the examples because I don't want my book to be too long. So anyone who's read prefaces in any language, Arabic, Latin, whatever it, whatever it is in medieval times, knows that authors often uh, use this trope of the fact that they're concerned uh, not to create an overly lengthy composition. Um, And again, uh, in the end of this section, you can see, again, that he mentions his fears that he's not going to live. But again, I don't think that in this case, this is the authorly trope. I think that Abu Faraj Harun really meant it. Um, if God, may he be exalted, extends the duration of my life and lightens the many burdens and increasing difficulties that I'm suffering more now than at any other time, perhaps I will do this. And apparently he was a sick man. Um, so, um, Finally, uh, he appeals to his readers. And he says... <clears throat> وَلَيْسَ أَذْكُرْ مَا ذَقَرْتُهُ مِنْ إِدْخَلْ هَذَيْنَ الدَّرْبَيْنَ الْمُشْتَمِلَيْنِ عَلَى أَقْسَامْ إِدَّ فِي هَذَا الْكِتَابِ مَا أَنَّهُمَا لَيْسَ مِمَا وُدِعَ لَهُ وَلَا قَصَدْهُمَا مُلْتَمِسُهُ إِلَّا لِإِقَامَةْ عُذُرْ عَنْدَهُ وَعَنْدَ غَيْرِهِ مِمَنْ عَسَاهُ يَقِفْ إِلَيْهِ لَا لِغَرَدٍ آخر ليس بمقصود فلا يتعقب متعقب ذلك ولا يقول قائل قد ودي الشيء في غير موضعه وكيف تصرفت الحال فالزلل كالملازم والخلل في حكم ليس بمنفك منه في قول وفعل um, I'll stop there for a second so he says I mentioned these things meaning <laughs> and I mentioned these two things. What are the two things? Meaning the facts that he's included discussions of meaning and discussions of grammar, uh, which comprise various parts of this book, even though they were not part of the original plan nor the requester's intent, only in order to establish a justification, other, for him, meaning the requester, this Abu Tayyib, and for others who might chance upon it, and not for any other reason. Okay, so he, he explains, the reason I'm explaining what's in my book is because I'm trying to justify myself. So very explicitly talking about the author's uh, devices. So let not the fault finder cavil, and let no one say that discussions have been placed in inappropriate locations, meaning why are grammatical explanations in this glossary. 
For in any case, error is a given and imperfection inescapable in speech as in deed. Ma'a ijtihadi jahdi aladhi a'taqiduhu bi taqsir ijtihad al-mujtahideen al-murtadina bi isabatihim mima siwa dhalak al-ijtihad min ijtihadatihim al-muwafaqa. So what is his point here? Despite my great effort, he tried very hard, which I consider far less worthy than the effort of those who are satisfied with their achievements. That is, this effort of mine is quite different from their successful efforts. So he has three claims for justification in this final section of his postface. Um, the first is what he said before, that it's really critical to have these grammatical explanations because otherwise he might not uh, succeed in writing them down at all. Uh, the second thing is the innate tendency of humans to err, which is a very typical authorial refrain in prefaces and postfaces. And for this reason, nobody should be too critical of his worth. And finally, Abu Faraj Harun describes his own personal imperfections, that he has made great effort, but on the other hand, um, he might not be as good as, as everybody else, or he might, um, other people might be more <coughs> successful, uh, even though he tried hard. Um, it's interesting that he does not make any conclusion from this, because sometimes authors will say, if I've made mistakes, please correct them. Other authors say, don't you dare correct my mistakes. He doesn't do either. Um, he preferred, but he apparently preferred to leave the work as it is, uh, errors and all. He concludes with a prayer to God, uh, requesting health and continued life. Um, and I beseech him, may he be praised, hoping that he will ease the path of commandment and will multiply the graces I have requested from him regarding it. Um, and perhaps in this way my desire will be achieved, for without these two, i.e. God's ease and grace, it is well known that his, the exalted's goal, i.e. The, the writing of the book is not just Abu Faraj Harun's goal, it's God's goal cannot be achieved due to the occurrence of unforeseen events. And thus, achieving the goal can occur following the removal of all hampering events by him, the exalted. And he, the exalted, is the grantor of grace regarding what I have requested of him uh, in his goodness. Now, prayer to God is, uh, is always a standard element of the preface or postface, but Abu Faraj Jirun's is a bit different from the usual praise of God, which usually, first of all, appears in the beginning of the, of the postface rather than at the end. Um, and the sincerity of his prayer is also likely given that he, he talks about having hurried to, to uh, record his explanations here because he, he was afraid that he wouldn't live long enough to record them <laughs> elsewhere. Um, and it seems, correct, it seems that he chose correctly in including these grammatical discussions in a glossary um, because, as I noted, it was likely the last work he composed. Um, now, to conclude, it's a little bit curious that Abu Faraj Harun des decides to include all of these uh, discussions and his justification um, as a postface, as opposed to as a preface for his glossary. Uh, he composed a preface in his other works. Uh, he, he doesn't have any other postfaces. Um, and the subjects that he used are more commonly found in prefaces uh, than in postfaces. Finally, the reader arrives at this postface only after reading the entire work, at which point all of his justifications and entreaties may fall on deaf ears. Um, it is clear, though, that this was his intent, uh, to include it at the end of his work, because um, he mentions the posterior placement in a number of places in the preface. He talks about what has preceded, i.e., the preceding reading in the glossary itself. Um, so I think upon examination of this postface, while he incorporates many expected elements from the authorial introduction in Arabic, Abu Faraj Harun's postface is particular to him, um, both personally um, and also as a, a Jew in the medieval Arabic-speaking world, in terms of um, just one example, the um, specific patron that he mentions. And he speaks with the confidence of a writer at home in his own literary environment, both his own immediate surroundings in Kara'i Jerusalem, as well as in the broader world of Arabic authorship beyond. Thank you very much. Questions? Jeffrey? Well, thank you very much, Miriam. It's a very important work uh, to be doing. It. These closer research of these prefaces and postfaces are, I think, tell us a lot about the sort of background of these texts. I'd just like to make a comment on the uh, uh, some of the 
practices I've been involved with in my own, in the additions which I've been involved with, and particularly out the table carefully. I mean, I was recently reading this uh, preface actually with a student, and I was, it struck me that, in fact, this is probably what, very, one of the most difficult parts of the text, and I thought it would be a nice introduction when you read the preface. But in fact, the student was clearly completely confused by a lot of the uh, very technical details. Um, and then, it, you know, it, I, I realized actually the fact that the preface is not particularly a good appropriate sort of preface for the work. Now that we've got the whole work edited, we can see exactly what the, uh, the, the, the basic content is. As we've seen in Mario Feld's uh, presentation, it's a very philosophical work. He's concerned a lot with the sort of human language in general, origin of human language. And in fact, what it, the main point of the preface, it really says, trying to justify the study of grammar, as a sort of means for exegesis, a sort of facilitative exegesis. But in actual fact, if you read the table carefully, it's not really the, the whole point of the, the book. I mean, it's really a philosophical work. Going, it's really a work of a linguist in, 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 interested in, in human language. And yet, it sort of struck me that almost he's writing for a, almost like it reminds me sometimes I'm writing grant application, but I put a spin on, on a sort of a, your your sort of your application, they're sort of trying to justify it. It's almost the feeling that it's sort of aimed at a sort of a particular audience perhaps or possibly sponsor. And um, you know it's not necessarily, you know, it, it's it's aimed outwards, not necessarily as a kind of a, a, necess a very accurate sort of summary of of the real spirit of the work. I mean, this is just my I think, I think, you know, this preface has to be judged in it, you know, for it of itself, but it's sort of, it's something to take into account quite. What's the purpose of these prefaces? I'll, I'll right? tell you my thought on the preface of the Kathy, <clears throat> which I think is fascinating. It's also really lucky you edited it, <laughs> because I could then have a parallel. Um, I think that the reason that he brings the lengthy grammatical example that he does in the beginning, I think it's because there's one... Um, one of the uh, elements that you had to have in introduction, it's in Syriac, it's, it starts in Syriac and then it's continued in, in Arabic. Um, I think in Syriac it's called the Alta, like the Illa, you know, the reason, the reason, uh, basically the reason the work is important, or the, not so much the reason you're composing the work, but the reason it's important. And I have always understood that, I mean, that's like the whole introduction, in the introduction to Keith Tabo Kefi, but he doesn't talk about his own circumstances. That's the only thing, pretty much, that he does there. Um, and I think he might be, it might be sort of touching on that authorial element. Mm, but the, the, the reason the field is important, something like that. Right, but it's not, it's almost if he's putting a spin on it. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. It's not really the saying what, it's not really relating directly to the content of the work. Yeah. It's like, uh, as long as he feels he has to, he has to uh, be rather apologetic on this point. Possibly because he's very innovative. I mean, that's another, I mean, you know, as we said this morning, it's incredibly innovative work. And it was, he was always trying to put it in the, you know, when you read the preface of Alterfi, you sort of feel you're, you're in the old, you're still in the traditional Karaite sort of grammatical tradition. But once you get into all this, big philosophical debates about the origin of language, you realize you're in a completely different world. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think also another reason that Judeo-Arabic words are so fascinating in terms of um, the analysis of authorial elements is that on the one hand, they have to show themselves to be um, acting in a certain tradition, you know, the, the Jewish tradition, and, and not so much, okay, we're writing in Arabic, but it's not so different from, I mean, not if you're a character, but it's not so different if you're, um, from the earlier Hebrew and Aramaic work. So on the one hand saying we are traditional, but on the other hand wanting to be innovative. And one um, analysis that I want to do is looking at authors who, how do they talk about themselves? Are they willing to say I am very innovative, innovative or do they want to say no, 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 I'm a compiler, I'm going with tradition. So it's interesting what you point out about the uh, cafe. And so the same about the title Cardi, by the way, the actual introduction, it's not really, again, it's almost like a spin, mm. saying, you know, actually I like 
I, I found this myself, actually. It's, that, it's kind of a bit of an identity. You know, you feel that you really, you really want to do work on the language per se, but you have to justify it. You know, it's almost... Um, and one wonders whether, therefore, there is an issue... I mean, it either is because it's because you're trying to link it with previous tradition, or you're trying to perhaps get communal support. Mm -hmm. Sponsorship, as we know, all these, all these works were required. So it's interesting that in the glossary he decides to come clean. And he says, you think one thing is in the work, well, I had to include lots of other things too. Yeah. Maybe that's because it's a postface rather than a preface. They the preface, right. you can promise things mm -hmm. and then yeah. to, to get the person who just picks up the store whether or not to see to buy it. But, mm -hmm. but uh, I think also when, when the person, I mean, we, as you said, it's often people say that they want to avoid being lengthy and then the book is 500 exactly. pages long, right? And, and then half a dozen times they'll say, because of the, uh, to, in order to make it short and whatever the, uh, uh, I just was going to suggest, I don't know, uh, this is Mat this Ibn Mansur, but uh, Abbasir's Tamiz is also called a Mansuri because it was uh, sponsored by uh, a Mansur. So maybe this is the father of the of this uh, Ben Mansur. Any other uh, comments? Well, that's about the glossary. Are you going to publish it? <laughs> not the introduction to glossary. Uh, no, no, no. Um, there, are, there are a number of people interested. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to. Did you go to the uh, grammatical parts of the glossary? No, I, the, only, the only work that I've done with the actual insights of the glossary are comparing some of the translations the translations in the Bible commentary that I worked on in my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And I found that um, nearly 100% of the translations were those of Abu Farshir, they, they coincided between the glossary and the Talqis, the Bible commentary. I'm curious to know whether that part, or the grammatical part, is similar to Kitab al of uh, Ayyuj, yeah. or is uh, totally different. Do you know um, how common it was to write in postscript as, co as, as compared with the previous? No, I will hopefully in four years when we <laughs> make more progress on the project. <laughs> right, but I haven't come across many. Yeah, tell me I'm yours. asking it because um, yesterday the commentary on Proverbs. Um, Talks about there's a verse that talks about a person who is interrupting somebody else's speech. I don't remember the verse itself. So he goes into talking about uh, the proper um, um, discourse and what one should do. And he says one of the things that he says, what um, kalam uh, that everybody knows, uh, so uh, introductions and, and postscripts. But he himself doesn't write close scripts so often. I mean, I haven't seen him writing. But he says this is a known way of talking with mm. introductions and conclusions. Mm. So um, on the one hand, it's a known thing, according to him. On the other hand, he doesn't do it. So um, interesting. Um, I wanted two remarks, really. One about the postscripts uh, or postfixes. Um, Every student these days is told to write your introduction after you've written the work. Mm -hmm. Does it seem to you that the medieval prefaces were also written after the works were completed? And were, like, in the good copy, included in the beginning of the copy? Yeah. No, you think yeah. they were composed in the beginning and then the work was written afterwards? Because, say, reading the introduction to Ibn Jannah al I get a very strong impression that he composed it after the work itself. Why? Oh, well, he knew so precisely, so in detail <coughs> what's going into it. Mm. I mean, can you really plan two volumes in great detail before writing them? Okay. That's a great question. So maybe your postface is not so different from prefaces. It was only in a different place in the manuscript. Mm -hmm. 
that's one. And the other was about the manuscripts. It interested me very much when you show different layouts, mm -hmm. how from running text it goes to more and more list style. Um, is it only the layout or do contents go lost because it looks so schematic in the in the later manuscripts. Yeah. Um, and it looks very much like the you know the earlier Karai texts, like the treatise on the Hebrew gods and nouns noun published by Jeffrey where it's indeed a list of uh, verbs and where it comes from, imperative and what it is derived mm -hmm. from. Okay, first of all, you raised an important point that I had meant to mention and forgot to. Um, it's interesting that Abu Farj Harun chose to write in this somewhat archaic genre. He was the only one of in 200 years of Karaite composition in Jerusalem who decided to write a glossary. Um, glossaries were are, are pretty well attested from the earlier period. Let's say from the 9th century. I mean, the other early among the earliest Judeo-Arabic texts that have that have survived. Um, but it seems that once verse-by-verse verse commentaries began to be written, starting in the early 10th century, nobody wanted to compose glossaries anymore. So it seems that Abu Farj Harun took up this archaic genre because it was requested of him. Um, a man wanted it for his two sons, it had a pedagogical function for them. Um, so it does have this sort of archaic look to it, and that's because it is uh, a bit of an archaic genre. Um, in terms of the contents, um, it's interesting, there I found when I was, this is going back to many moons ago when I was cataloging this work, um, there were shortened versions actually of the glossary, I should mention that. If we talk about, we've been talking about abbreviations, there were abridgments of the glossary, that's for sure. Um, I didn't do a systematic analysis of whether things were lost, but it seemed that the contents were very conservative. When I did some certain comparisons of entries, I didn't well, I just wonder, like, when you say that there are ridges, does that mean the definitions were shorter, or there are fewer? No, that there? entries were were removed. Mm -hmm. Entries were removed. Entries were removed. Oh. And in one case, it's very funny. There's one manuscript that I found. One of these abridgments, where entries had been removed, where someone else had gone in and filled in all the missing entries. <laughs> so, so not everybody was happy with that. Um, but I found that um, it was. This is, this is not something that I've checked 100%, um, but on certain like, sort of drills that I did through the composition, I found that it was, um, it was conservative, that it was quite, it was preserved, mm -hmm. that um, it was actually a composition that, was, that didn't change very much. So the change yeah. in layout didn't go hand in hand with the change or shortening of content? No. no. Yeah, and, and I found some very monumental versions of it also. I mean, it was clearly popular and people invested in having it copied. Thank you very much.